Welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast with me, Sam Harris, your host. I invite fascinating humans from all walks of life to share their wisdom and unpack their mindsets and formulas for growth. Hello and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast. Today, I am beyond happy to be interviewing Richard Shaw. Now, he's run a few businesses before and his first two businesses nearly killed him. And Richard made it his mission to ensure that other entrepreneurs did not go through the same struggles alone. And to do this, he co-founded Unleashed CEO, which helps visionary entrepreneurs scale their time to give them more freedom by recruiting and training people that are better at managing and leading teams. And so the entrepreneurs can just go and be the creative weirdos like me because of um, I'm really struggling with these problems. And so it's perfect to be talking to you today, Richard. Man, it's such an honor to be here, Sam. I've really enjoyed our past conversations and I think today's going to be dynamite too. Yeah, me too. So um, I gave a bit of a vague intro and it would be lovely to hear in your own words sort of a bit more about your background like what were you interested in as a child and what kind of led you into starting businesses in the first place yeah so my parents were about as crazy as i am entrepreneurs to the core and i really credit a lot of my you know nature versus nurture the nurture side at the very least probably the nature side as well so i just kind of grew up in this pioneering slightly crazy but also very exciting environment A lot of new things were being birthed. And I think for me, that taught me the value of pushing yourself. And it showed me that it was possible, right, to create new things out of nothing. And I think for a lot of people, that's not the path, right, that they started out with. So I'm really grateful for that. I really feel like I stand on the shoulders of giants because of that. And I always tell people, like, I caught the entrepreneurial bug early, right? So you know, entrepreneurs talk about selling lemonade when they were little. I'm not sure if I started that young, but when I was in high school, it just sort of clicked for me where I was like, man, I can teach other people music, which was a skill I had. My family was very musical and make money and I can set the prices of how much money I want to charge and get paid these huge lump sums up front versus working for this job where they just pay me weekly. I really like this. And so it was sort of like it taught me the value of very early on being self-motivated, being able to kind of set my own schedule. I think a lot of the things that entrepreneurs are attracted to, there were things that piqued my interest very early on. I think you can really centralize it around this idea of freedom, right? Which is, I think, where most entrepreneurs start their business for time and financial freedom. Honestly, man, that was very attractive to me, just that idea to kind of be able to set the parameters of how I spent my time and not have someone else define how much value and therefore money I could create as well. Yeah, that's certainly something that I've always just like had to go towards. Like I just found it very difficult having like just a set value on yourself as a worker. And like, it doesn't really matter how much work you do often. You just like, this is what your worth is. And it's, it doesn't represent my sort of fascination to just go and do something like a hell of a lot better than like it's ever been done before. And like where everything everything's on your own terms, it's just so much more exciting and like, I'm happy to live and die by my own like successes than to just sort of be like, cool, this is all you're going to get. But like, there's no inspiration to like do something epic or if you do a bit shit, it also doesn't matter. I'm like, nah, okay, okay. I always want the riskier side of things. Okay. Interesting. And so then what were the businesses that you first started and what were the issues that you faced with them that led to you um, being nearly killed by them? <laughs> yeah. So basically the first business I started in high school, right? It wasn't actually my first two businesses that almost killed me. The first one I started, I was in high school. I was teaching music. Not really like a soul-killing business. You know, I I did get very busy. It was kind of a surprise success and took on a lot of just a huge kind of load of private clients. Pretty much all my time outside of schoolwork was kind of consumed by that. But I was also making great money. And so I was like, wow, this is fun. As a kid in high school, I can buy my own car. I can, you know, with cash, I can do all this kind of stuff that some of my peers couldn't do. And I think it also, again, like my family, they did a great job providing for us, but they were by no means wealthy. And so it really kind of fueled this thing of like, wow, I can actually create whatever I want to create if I'm willing to work hard and I put in the value of serving other people. They're willing to exchange money for value. And so that was kind of my first business in high school. I kind of lost the love of that transition that, you know, as I started to exit high school and actually went into wealth management and financial services, kind of was always fascinated with, again, wealth and building wealth. And so I wanted to study that. And there was an opportunity with a company to kind of start my own firm, my own team. Went into that, again, sort of success by accident. I think mostly just because I was curious and passionate and I think a strong work ethic. That took off, kind of built my own team underneath of that. 
And I kind of thought as a result of that success that I was unstoppable, right? Then in my naivety, I was like, man, well, if one business is good, two is better, you know? So, so let's do two. And so I actually went to a couple of my most wealthy clients and pitched them on a real estate investing trust, an REIT. I've been reading some books about real estate, doing a lot of studying, went through some courses, some different things. And I saw an opportunity in Grand Rapids, which was a city right kind of west of us that had gone through the 2008 market crash. Uh, This was 2010 at the time and was one of the top 10 rebound markets. So there was massive appreciation potential. I mean, homes were appreciating 20 to 30% within months, right? We're not talking within years, within months. It was was absolutely insane. So went and pitched my wealthiest clients on a, a plan to go take advantage of that opportunity Somehow, apparently, I was good at you know selling and communicating vision, and they got in. So we had angel investors. We started pouring you know massive amounts of money into this Grand Rapids market. I had never managed a real estate investment company before in my life, and brought on partners who supposedly knew what they were doing. And dude, it was an absolute disaster trying to manage that in a different city while running my other business. I was in my first year of marriage. And it was a nightmare. We had partners who like literally stole money from us and betrayed us. We got defrauded by the state government. We were getting sued at the time because of a deal that went bad. We had multiple six figures in damage done by a storm that rolled through to our properties that our insurance company was denying the claim and refusing to pay. Dude, it was a disaster. So we were in serious trouble. Our angel investors were threatening to pull out. And basically, I remember the day I literally walked into my my home, slipped into the spare room, avoiding my wife, and curled up in a fetal position in the corner and cried out to God for help. Wow. <laughs> and that was kind of my my low moment where I'm like, man, I don't even know if I'm an entrepreneur. Maybe I just faked it and, yeah. and thought I was, and everything's kind of crumbling around me. And so that's kind of what led me to that place of, as you said, my two businesses almost killing me. Wow. Yeah, that's a nice story. Thanks for that. It's uh, very humbling to hear. Similarly, I started my first business and it went quite well and I had no clue what I was doing, but I thought I did. <laughs> like I was at uni and started this business. People immediately wanted to pay for it and started growing really fast. And then I was running a business <laughs> and sold it a few years later. and was like, so this business thing, I'm pretty good. <laughs> and then many fair years later, actually working out how one runs a business and just realized what actually worked about the business that I first did besides me being a genius turns out that there was just certain things that you should do that I was largely ignored and had no idea about I just happened to accidentally do them the first time hmm. yeah life hey hard life yeah cool so um how did you get out of that situation did God reach down and fix everything or did you have to like get <laughs> up off the floor and do some stuff yourself yeah, so there's there was a burning bush, angels sung, you know, a ladder descended from the sky. There's all sorts of crazy things I could tell you about, but no, but in in all seriousness, I do think there was some divine intervention for me, but practically what that looked like was just the right mentors and advisors really coming around me. Thankfully, I sought out some wise counsel and some people who were more experienced, who knew a little bit more about business, who weren't so visionary and were a little more practical implementers, I call them now. And quite truthfully, man, thanks to kind of their wise advice and some real practical changes in how I was leading the company, we were able to turn that situation around, bring it back into the black. And uh, I eventually ended up selling my shares in that company to my partner and kind of moving on from there. But the thing that really stands out to me when I think back on that season is at the root, I was alone and I was operating like a lone wolf. I didn't have wise counsel. I didn't have a true team around me. It was the whole business was entirely built around me. And if it's built around you, when you reach the limits of your knowledge, your expertise, your capacity, your time, the business will falter and or fail based on your limits, your constraints. And that's a very dangerous place as an entrepreneur, especially as an entrepreneur who's ambitious and wants the thing to keep growing and growing and growing. And we always hunger for kind of that growth. Heck, we're on the Growth Mindset Podcast, right? Which a lot of entrepreneurs are probably listening to because we want to always keep growing. And growth is great. I'm all for growth. But you have to understand growth comes at the cost of control. An old mentor of mine used to say, you can have control or you can have growth, but you can't have both. And I think for me, a really big learning lesson from that season was I was trying to control everything. 
I hadn't built a true team around my vision and around a clear kind of business plan for the company. I wasn't operating and leading like a CEO. I was running around like a crazy entrepreneur still, even though our company had outgrown that. And, you know, looking back on that season, what I should have done was surrounded myself with a true leadership team as well as wise, wise advisors that actually could carry that vision forward versus building the business around myself and then, man, expecting it not to crumble when I reached the limits of my capacity. That was definitely not wisdom. Mm, yeah, I like that. That's a uh, really nice quote. You can have growth, you can have control, but you can't have both. I am, um, like I was saying with my first business, I, I grew really well in the first year, but I was doing it all myself, complete chaos, burnt out and basically sort of quit. And one guy who I sort of, I literally interviewed him the day before I left to just sort of manage some like deliveries and things. Um, he ended up like completely taking over all admin and like day to day stuff and was like an ex accountant that wanted like more of a lifestyle job where I got to go cycling, delivering stuff half a day and then just organizing stuff the other half a day. Loved it, took off all my work and then I just moved into like doing sales and stuff when I felt like it and in between my uni work and just kind of driving the vision and it was, it was perfect. But like completely unplanned. Literally, I just sort of took a one-way ticket to Ibiza and fucked off. It was like, I have no idea what's going to happen. And um, turns out it worked perfectly. Not how I'd suggest um, <laughs> fixing your business. It was was severe chance that I happened to employ the right person just at the right moment. But um, mm. yeah, finding someone that can just deal with the, the things that you're not struggling with and building a good team is pretty essential. And yeah, giving the control. <laughs> Otherwise, you can't get growth. Nice. Mm. Um, so I guess you, you learn from that, the value of having people around. And then that's what drove you to then build your current business of helping just create these people that can deliver and execute on stuff and help free entrepreneurs to be their creative entrepreneurial selves. Yeah, man, that's right. Unleashed CEO for me comes out of that season of just looking back on it and going, what do I wish I would have had? Right? Mm. Like, what do I wish I would have had when I was, you know, curled up in a fetal position in the corner and felt completely alone. What do I wish I would have had? And I think it is like a true partner, not necessarily from an equity standpoint, because I had a partner. When you use the word partner, it actually implies the idea that it's someone who is for you and on your side, who has complementary skills, experiences, and resources to bring to the partnership. And I know a lot of entrepreneurs who have partners, but they're partnered up just with other entrepreneurs. And what they actually need is an implementer. They need somebody who is not entrepreneurial, 20 ideas a day. They need somebody who literally eats and breathes and thinks execution, systems, organization, team management, leadership, finances. You know, for me, there's kind of five areas of mastery that a true implementer really has to have to support the weaknesses of most entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs, to be clear, have great strengths, you know, sales ability, the ability to cast a vision, that quick start nature where it's like anything is possible and they just go and do it. Raw passion. You know, a lot of them are incredibly hard workers and I, I salute that. But you have to understand that for a lot of entrepreneurs, what got them here is not what will get them there. In other words, what got them to this point in their business, for many of them, you know, million dollar business or something like that, is not what's going to actually get them to their vision of, you know, a $10 million business or a multi million dollar business. The same things that are needed to start a business and kind of get it to product market fit are not the same things required to actually scale a business and you know exit the go-to-market phase. I'm using kind of VC terms, but I think you get the point that yeah. I'm making. They're totally different skill sets. And a lot of times entrepreneurs, I see them exhausting a lot of time and energy trying to become something that they're not, which is a great manager or kind of this corporate executive and if you feel like that's your path, more power to you. But for the vast majority of entrepreneurs, what they truly want and are great at is what they started their business for. Freedom, ideas, the ability to, as you put it, create, to build big relationships, make big sales, network, relationships, right? All of those things. Those are things that will drive growth for the company so long as the company has a solid infrastructure of operations. And that's where that yin to yang implementer comes in, where as Gino Wickman puts it, somebody I really respect and who lives about 40 minutes away from me, it's like this rocket fuel combination where you get two different chemical agents. When you combine them, it creates exponential thrust 
for yeah. a force, right? And that's where you need that entrepreneur and implementer. You need that, as Gino would say, visionary and that integrator, right? When you combine those two things together, man, scaling the company and getting time freedom as an entrepreneur is really, really actually possible. Yeah, definitely. So did you go straight into that or did you like work with Gina Wickman and these things for a bit, like helping other entrepreneurs sort of scale themselves and become more of a CEO as opposed to like a founder first? Like, Yeah, so I spent a lot of time, actually years, when I was running my other businesses on the side, just consulting entrepreneurs. And the unfortunate thing was I didn't have the clarity at the time that what we were trying to do was turn entrepreneurs into implementers or turn visionaries into integrators. And unfortunately, I see a lot of consulting out there that tries to do this. It just It's essentially you're consulting or training the wrong person sometimes. Mm. And so I did spend time doing that. And somewhat to my frustration, a lot of times it didn't get results. But when I look back at my story, I'm like, man, I'm not even that great at those things either. I'm good at consulting on them. But when it comes to actually yeah. doing them within my business, I don't even want to do them. And this kind of led to that discovery, which I'm really thankful to, you know, Gina Wickmo, Ben, Mark Winters for influencing my thinking on this. And also I, I got to be a part of the early days of kind of implementing US for some companies. And the discovery was all of these systems and tools are great. EOS is a phenomenal framework. Our business runs on EOS. But the whole thing is contingent on having a leadership team of the right people in the right seat. And most entrepreneurs I talk to do not have that leadership team. And they don't even have what I would consider to be the first and most important part of that leadership team, which is that integrator, that implementer role. And so without that, you can have all the structure, tools, all of these different frameworks in the world, and you still don't really get the full impact of them if the entrepreneur is the one who's trying to implement them. Yeah, I agree. And I did the um, you know Prince 2 management course thing and like it's all kind of fairly obvious i totally understand the whole thing nothing difficult about it but actually running a really organized <laughs> project managed thing that is something I, I just really struggle to actually do which is annoying as hell but i'm qualified to do it <laughs> not that, that means that i think totally agree with that and yeah going in and teaching me all of these things is i wouldn't want to sort of completely go against growth mindset like i can get better at some stuff but it's also mm why would I put lots of effort into doing something that like, I'm not going to be brilliant at compared to having someone that's just great at these things when I'm really great at other stuff where I could be putting my energy into, really. You really highlighted, Ben, a, a really important point that I think, I think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with the difference between knowledge and implementation, right? Mm -hmm. The accumulation of knowledge and wisdom is invaluable. And as an entrepreneur, you should understand how to do the finances of your business, right? You should understand project management. You should understand leadership. You should understand communication. None of these things are a cop out for you to grow and develop yourself as an entrepreneur. And I think that's where a lot of entrepreneurs, because they're so driven and growth minded, they almost feel like hiring this stuff out or getting someone else to do it is a cop out, right? As if they're like, well, I'm just, you know, kind of sloughing that off onto somebody else. Not at all. You need to grow in those areas. But the distinction is not whether you can learn and maybe even master some of those areas. It's where will you spend your time to make the highest impact? Because you, like every other human being on the planet, only has 24 hours in a day. Mm. And to the extent that you are spending your time doing things that you don't love and aren't great at, you will make a far less impact than if you are spending your time doing what you love to do and are great at and are truly masterful at. And that's where for a lot of entrepreneurs, if you dive down to the core, they have no desire, nor do they even have maybe the makeup to become truly great at some of these things. And so that's where I think entrepreneurs struggle to be vulnerable and admit, this is not my strength. Doesn't mean I can't learn it, but to be vulnerable enough to go, this is not my strength, and it is the strength of other people. There are other people who have this strength. And so as a CEO, I have to make the determination to go, as an entrepreneur, it was just I had to figure everything out myself. As a CEO, my job is not to figure everything out myself. My job is to find the right people and empower them to see the vision move forward. Yeah, I think it's really hard to understand just how much more you can get out of yourself often when you're kind of, you're struggling on the things that aren't your strengths. You sort of, I find like you actually spread yourself so thin, you don't even realize how much you can get done when you actually spend most of your time in the areas that you're actually really good at. 
and it's kind of like hugely relieving and empowering when you just recognize how much strength you have. I think it also leads into partly um, imposter syndrome mm. as well. When you're doing things that you aren't so good at, you can't kind of start to question yourself like, okay, maybe I'm not a good CEO. Maybe I'm not a good leader. Perhaps I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm just, I'm just making a mess of fucking everything. <laughs> like, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> when actually you're bloody great. You're just not doing the things that you're great at. And um, mm. if you just chill out, give yourself some space to do the things you're awesome at. You're like, holy crap, I'm an amazing individual. I am so creative. I am <laughs> I'm awesome. Life's brilliant. And um, then you wake up every day with lots of energy and you do really cool stuff. And uh, yeah. So. That's so true, man, from my experience. Mm. And that's exactly where I was. Imposter syndrome, 100%. Am I even an entrepreneur? Do I even have what it takes to be a CEO? I remember asking myself that. And it depends on how you define CEO, right? I think a lot of times we get confused around these corporate titles and all this kind of fancy language. And it's like, at some level, you get to define, like, what does it look like at the top level to lead your company? And then you can build a team around your weaknesses and focus on your strengths. I would say there's no, no weakness in that. That is the greatest type of strength. Yeah, I've been defining myself as like a creative, energetic oddball more rather than a chief executive officer. I'm like, that, that fits what I do more of the time. <laughs> Someone can do like a management, you know, managing director or something, they can, they can do the stuff. <laughs> and I'll run around having creative ideas and being a bit odd. That's, <laughs> that's my thing. That's my calling. I'm good at that. Yeah, man. For me, it, it is interesting because I think a lot of this ties into imposter syndrome and imposter syndrome ties into identity. Mm. And I think you and I both know, right, as people who love to study psychology and growth mindset, that identity is one of the highest drivers of human behavior, right? If you believe that you are a certain type of person, you tend to act in accordance with that. Our behaviors tend to align with the things we truly believe about ourselves, right? At an identity level. And so to me, it's always interesting. I codify most entrepreneurial CEOs. It really stands for chief everything officer. Nobody would say, well, I'm a chief everything officer. But when you look at how they behave, essentially, they believe that everything in their business is dependent on them, that they have to maintain control or it'll all fall apart. And that identity informs your behavior and it definitely informs the results you get and the reality that you experience within your business. So then let's go to the other side, right? What happens if you shed the identity of chief everything officer and step into what I call the identity of an unleashed CEO? And an unleashed CEO says, hey, I can have as much time freedom as I want to at so long as I play the true role of a CEO, which is to assemble the right people to actually execute on the vision, right? Assemble the right people and the right resources to execute on the vision. And to the extent I do that well, there is no limit on how much freedom I can experience within my business. I think that's a truly powerful transformation, but that's a big gap for a lot of entrepreneurs. But I think you have to make that identity shift if you want the reality that you're experiencing within your business to actually change. Yeah. So I want to stop wanting to control everything. And, um, but that's ironically exactly what you want to do is, is not control everything because then you have mm. a business that run, works for you as opposed to you working for the business, which, um, mm. is kind of the point of starting it. Right. Cool. Nice. So how do you identify people that can be implemented for your business and then like give them the tools and training and things they need to sort of take over from you then so that you can like a step back. I love to talk about this. Uh, great question. So the first thing, man, that I would say is how do you find, to answer the question, how do you find those people? I'll just start by saying not by accident. The first thing that I think is critical when you talk about finding these people is identifying who are we talking about, right? When we say implementer or these people, we have to move away from abstraction and into a true clarity of the profile. Who are we actually looking for? And this gets extra confusing because there's a lot of terms thrown around, right? COO, integrator, president, general manager, chief of staff, executive administrator. There's all of kind of these different terms, operations manager that get thrown around when we're kind of talking about this function. But what I would say is the most important thing to start with is really clearly defining the success profile of what you need in an implementer based on the goals and needs that you have 
as the CEO slash founder and the company has based on where it's headed, its trajectory. So it's kind of like, what do you need and what does the company need out of an implementer in this season? I think that's the starting point is getting really, really clear about that and mapping out the success profile for that person. Before we ever go try to find someone, we have to know who we're trying to find. And my big tip here is don't start with the title, right? Because a lot of people make that mistake. Well, I just need a title. No, no, no. Define the functions, okay? Who do you actually need? Who does your business actually need? And there are some things that are universal, I say about implementers. They need to be good at leading and managing people, right? They need to be good at driving execution or getting getting ish done, right? They need to be good at numbers, right? They need to understand how to run the finances of a business and understand the, you know, the how to generate a profit, essentially, you know, income minus expenses equal profit. There's a lot that goes into actually making that function though within a business. And then they also just, they need to be detail oriented, organized, and have the ability to harness chaos into systems and processes, Okay. So if you wanted me to kind of give you high level, like I would say those are the universal things you need to be looking for, but there are also unique things for your company that need to be teased out and called out. And this is why we have this process. We call it vision matching for this specific purpose. And it's really where we tease out your unique profile as an entrepreneur and the specific stage that your company is in, and then assemble a customized implementer success profile that is matched to your vision, the vision of what you need and the vision of what the business needs. And that, again, is what I would say is kind of the first and most important step. Once you've got that success profile mapped out and it's customized to you, then I think you have to think about the art and science of finding an implementer. So to me, when we talk about hiring or recruiting great people, there's a lot of conversation about the science of it. And by that, I mean... Where do you run job ads? You know, how do you do outbound recruiting? What interviews do you run? What questions do you ask? What assessments do you use? All of kind of these very technical scientific things. And let me say this. The science is very, very important. You need to have a great filtering and screening and advertising and and vetting process. But the part that gets missed is the art of it, which is how do we make sure we actually attract the right kind of people? into our scientific hiring process in the first place, right? That's the art. And that's what so many people miss and why they don't get the results that they want. And to me, the art comes down to leveraging the most under-leveraged asset in recruiting that you have as an entrepreneurial company, which is your vision and your growth opportunity. And this is where you have to do a great job as the CEO, actually what I call weaponizing your vision and your growth plan for your company into something that can be deployed to attract the caliber of candidates you're actually looking for, right? These people are typically not looking for a job and they are not oftentimes out of work. There's rare ones you can catch in transitions in their career, okay? So why would they leave what they're doing successfully to come be a part of your entrepreneurial company who probably has no benefits, can't pay quite as well, you know, like why would they leave that? Well, studies show that the number one reason people like that change careers is because it's not just compensation, it's vision. They want to be a part of making an impact. They want to contribute to something. They want to grow something. So that's where you have to do a great job doing the art side well, which is actually crafting your vision, your opportunity, and putting that out to the right people in the market to attract them into your hiring process in the first place. Get the right caliber of people and repel the wrong caliber of people, the people you don't even want to have to waste your time with. And then, of course, we do all the science stuff well, all the filtering, screening, you know, advertising, vetting, references, all of that stuff has to be done extremely, extremely well so that we filter down to the very, very most qualified candidates and then obviously choose the best cultural and skills fit. Wow. Nice. I really like that breakdown. Thanks so much. Like the science of recruiting is something that I haven't spent lots of time on. It's kind of a bit boring for me. But yeah, the art is something super interesting. I've been thinking about some kind of like more fun ways to kind of post things on LinkedIn that are like a stupid video or something that aren't really being done so much. So I think it's a bit like samey and trying to like stand out from the crowd. So um, maybe I see some of those things as they come to fruition on my end. 
Cool. Is there anything that I haven't asked you around the whole sort of concept of becoming an unleashed CEO that I should have asked? Well, I think you asked it. I just didn't answer it yet. And that's, um, it's one thing to find this person. It's another thing to onboard, train, and empower them. And to be truthful, a lot of the people who I see even find these people fail to retain them because they don't do a good job onboarding, empowering, and training that person. They don't know how. And they don't even know how to give up control. (laughs) So that person doesn't feel empowered. They feel underappreciated or under leveraged or underutilized. And ultimately, they go elsewhere, right? Because they have options. I've seen this over and over and over with entrepreneurs who find really, really great planners and struggle to retain them. And then they just blame external forces. And they go, oh, nobody, you know, nobody would really be as committed to this thing as I am. Well, no, you just did a really poor job empowering that person. Can we just have an open and honest conversation? So I think the other piece of advice that I would give is maybe you have this person right now and you don't feel like they're fully empowered. Maybe you feel like you might know who this person is, but you wouldn't know how to onboard, train, and empower them. Or maybe you're kind of unwilling to even engage the process of finding them because deep down you know, as things stand currently, you would probably do a poor job setting them up to win. Here's my quick pieces of advice for you as we kind of bring this to a wrap. So number one, as tedious as this sounds... If you're trying to find this person, actively have found them or thinking about it, get really clear about just a clear onboarding plan for this person. What is it going to take to get them up to speed on your company as quickly as humanly possible, right? I call this onboarding has the highest ROI of just about anything you could invest your time into because the faster you can get somebody focused on hitting the measurables and targets that you want for them, the quicker you start to ROI in your investment on them right? And this is something, again, we help clients with all the time. It's like really creating a very clear pathway to get that type of person fully onboarded and integrated into your company. So onboarding, number one, invest time there and get some outside help if you need it. The second thing I would say is training. Most of the time, entrepreneurs don't actually know how to train this person because they're not good at it anyways. And I would say this is a great opportunity to invest in sometimes an executive coach, There are very few companies out there who are kind of training these people versus entrepreneurs. We do happen to be one of them. But make sure that you actually capitalize on the investment you make into this person by investing in their training and their development and fully giving them the tools and resources they need to actually help you get what you want. I I always say there's five areas of mastery that an implementer must have. And so even if you just want to think about these five areas that they need, you need to make sure they're fully trained on, not just in general, but for your company, right? So there's leadership, how to lead, manage, and hold people accountable within your company. There's numbers, being able to oversee the finances of your company and make sure that it generates a profit. There's planning, making sure they're empowered to actually plan ahead, capacity, goals, you know, numbers, targets, projections, understanding how to do all of that. Because these people thrive on planning and they need it and your company needs it. From planning flows hiring. So understanding, making sure they have clear processes or at least clear training on how to hire A players because they're going to come in and probably need to fill some gaps within your company. They need to know how to run great hiring processes. And then lastly is scaling. Making sure they understand what is the scaling model for your business and they're fully equipped to put the correct levers in place to actually help you get to your strategic plan. I know that was really, really fast, but those are kind of my notes on onboarding and training the implementer type. Nice. Oh, cool. Thanks so much. Glad I asked. And final few things. What is one of your earliest ever memories from childhood that's kind of vivid? Christmas morning. I think I was five at the time. And I remember getting this really, really sweet lightsaber that I asked for. And my mom had actually knit me a Jedi Knight cloak. And so from that moment on, I was, I was a real Jedi. Wow. That's cool. Your mom's awesome. She is pretty awesome. Epic. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Okay. And then the other one is, what's one of the kindest things someone has done for you recently? One of the kindest things that has been done for me recently, I don't know why this comes to mind, my daughter drew me this like beautiful picture and it was like her and me and we were holding hands and our whole family was together. It was just so heartfelt. It was really touching and it impacted me. So that was, that was one that comes to mind. Cool. Nice. Totally great. Where can we find out more about you? 
Yeah. So if you guys want, you can go, if you want to just check out a little bit about Unleash CEO and what we do, you can go to our website, unleashed.ceo. It's not .com, it's just unleashed.ceo. There's actually a free training on there that you can click through to that actually walks you through kind of the exact process. And we'll even give you some of our tools that we use internally to recruit and train these implementer types, the yin to the entrepreneurial yang. So I'd encourage you to, to check that out. Also, uh, we have a, a YouTube channel. If you go to Unleash CEO on YouTube, you search that. There's tons of free resources, training on kind of how to find and empower implementers and how to build more of a self-managing company and team that gives you back time freedom. Cool. Well, thanks. I um, have already gone checked out. It's great. Hence why I've had you on the show. So thanks so much for giving us the lowdown on um, coming in Unleash CEO and just uh, growing yourself and really good growth mindset attitude there super appreciated thanks richard it was an honor being here sam thanks for having me thanks a bundle for listening if you liked it share it rate it remember growth is all about consistency and persistency so keep showing up and keep showing love and if you want to enjoy your life start by enjoying your day